where are we? We can be strong, we can wait, we can live for so long. Build on a flame where we never burn, no one could ever, ever return. You are the reason I'm on you, reason I love you. You're the thing I need, cause it's just, it's just you. We ready? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can go. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Appleton Room. My name is Paul. It's Miss Lynn Murphy. We are so excited to see you all today. This is the final installment of our Heart series. He is here as our Rebit. Mitchell Distinguished Scholar in Residence. We've been pleased to have him all semester talking to our students, our faculty, our staff about black media outlets, about the options for your lives, about his life and how that's working out as a model for our own. So we're really excited to see you all. Mr. Martin is a distinguished scholar. He has traveled the country, traveled the world, um, is featured on CNN, has been featured on BET, has had several television shows, is streaming live on the internet every day. We invite you to come back to the Jubilee Hall to this room between 5 and 7 this evening where he will be streaming his show, Roland Martin Unfiltered, live to the web with you all as his studio audience. So send the link to your parents, tell them you're part of a, a live event happening at this. So we're really excited to have Mr. Martin. We look forward to his conversation this afternoon. We encourage you all to stay and invite your friends. There is a reception in the back when this is over. Mr. Martin. Cool. We're excited to have you, sir. All right. First, when she say reception, appreciate it. First, when she say reception, she meant free food. So, uh, first time we did that, uh, it was packed, and I was like, "Y'all came for the food. Don't front. Don't front." But it's all good, though. Good. I, we, look, we did the exact same thing uh, when I was in college, so uh, those things happened. So, um, so how's everybody doing? Good. All right, then. Y'all all scared of the front? Y'all like, no, we're not trying to sit near the front. Uh, so let's see who's in the room. So I'll start over here. Uh, name, where you're from, and your, your classification. From where? Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina, all right. Okay, with a mask, you got to project, so I got to hear you. Lagos, Nigeria, got it. St. Louis, got it. All right, cool. Got it. Hello, my name is Layla Eliade. I'm a freshman computer science major from Jones Hall, Arkansas. All right. Hello, my name is Mariah Holbrook. I'm a college major. Say it again. Miss Tennessee. Got it. Hey, y'all. I'm Madison Nelson. I'm a freshman biology major from Monroe, Louisiana. Monroe. 
All right. I'm Andrew Hendricks, senior computer science major from right here in Nashville, Tennessee. All right. Hi, my name is Charisma Baby. I'm a psychology major from Memphis, Tennessee. All right, cool. Two from Nashville. Back. H Town, what high school? Lamar. All right, I always check because some people claim Houston and actually from Houston, so that's actually in the city. Yeah, I'm Jack Yates High School, so we always do that. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I am Sierra Cook, a senior biology major here, and I'm originally from Mississippi. Memphis. All right, second one from Memphis. All right, bro, you can take your backpack off, Doc. We ain't going anywhere. All right, cool. My name is Eva Davidson. I'm a senior biology major from Long Island, New York. Long Island? All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Kashana Temple. I am a business administration major from Memphis, Tennessee. All right, third person from Memphis. All right. Hi, my name is Nyla Stoner, and I'm a sophomore biology major from Charlotte, North Carolina. All right. All right, third Nashville person. Hey everyone, my name is Tony Hernandez. I'm a computer science major from Lee Sniper. Cool. Hi, my name is Jasmine Mitchell. I'm a history major, junior from Gallatin, Tennessee. Hey y'all, my name is Janae Tennis Ellison. I'm a junior political science major from Louisville, Kentucky. All right, cool, cool. All right, y'all, just round of applause. Y'all go ahead. All right. So I always do that, where they're from, uh, which gives us an indication, again, of, of, you know, how we grew up, how we see things in terms of how we sort of uh, look, look at the world. And so uh, I, as I was thinking about what I want to talk about, uh, I saw something today that I thought really goes right in hand in hand with um, what I've been talking about in terms of us owning the narrative, owning our own story, the importance of black owned media. So uh, how many of you read anything from complex? Complex. Raise your hand. Complex. Complex. So in in the media space, complex uh, is considered by a lot of a lot of advertising agencies to have uh, the widest reach to t in terms of reaching African-Americans. So if you look at the content that they have, uh, who they're targeting with a lot of their content. Now, Complex is not black owned. BuzzFeed actually owns a combination between Hearst. Because what, what we keep seeing happen of black targeted folks love reaching black people black folks america i say this all the time america has always loved black people don't get always love black people because we've always made america money see a lot of people say oh my goodness you know we've had white supremacy we've had racism no 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 america, because us has made them a lot of money. We are excellent billionaires. Yet when you ask how good are we, then the conversation changes. And so I want to talk about you being caretakers of the culture. So when y'all how many times have how many, I'm trying to have y'all even use that. I'm trying to have you use it or heard it. Oh, this is for the culture, for the culture, for the culture. What does that actually mean? Just give me, y'all can, and if you want, you can keep your mask on. I don't know what y'all rules are in the room, but we're spaced out. But it's up to y'all. When someone says it or you hear does that mean we're doing Yeah. Advancing or enhancing black people. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. 
only for black people in our space. Okay, all right. How would you define it doing something for the culture? What does that mean? Yep, stand up so everybody can hear you. In terms of things along those lines, doing something for the culture. When you hear doing this for the culture, what does that mean? Keep the legacy going for African Americans. Come on. You know, that look like me and everything like that, which says a lot because I want to be an OBGYN. So not just like fashion trends or just right. trends, but also giving them like a goal or a role model or something like, okay, you know, I can do that. Too. Okay, cool. Y'all come on. Y'all sitting down? Okay. Number seven. Number seven. It's all good. We got seats. It's no big deal. So, when, so when, when I hear that phrase, for the culture, it is a problematic phrase for me because you can do something for the culture, but the question is, do you own it? Do you own it? Who is benefiting from doing something for the culture? Um, the, the reason that's important because when we start thinking about when we say what we do for the culture, we know that black people are America's tastemakers in terms of music, in terms of clothing, in terms of style. I mean, we drive that entire space. When you look at, um, for the longest, use of cell phones and PDAs, we over-index among anyone else. When you look at the folks who are, uh, who are first embracers of various apps of technology, it's us. I look at last year during, during COVID, folks were at home and couldn't go out and all of a sudden folks was just was hyped about the app Clubhouse. Who, who's heard of Clubhouse? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. How many, raise your hand all the way up. How many of y'all have used Clubhouse? You heard of it, you've used it. App launches, it's first, it's very exclusive. Only iPhone users, then you have to get an invitation. It's sort of like the VIP club. Everybody, everybody want to get to the VIP section at a club, but then when you actually in the VIP section, you realize it's the same boring ass spot as it is everywhere else. But it's just this whole idea of, ooh, it's the VIP section. And so all these people were hyped to get on Clubhouse. And all of a sudden, Clubhouse raised $100 million, launched this app. And nine months after they launched, someone tried to buy an equity stake in Clubhouse. And the valuation of Clubhouse went to $4 billion. $4 billion. Meek Mill when he was on and Kevin Hart was on and all these folks hopped on and all of a sudden Clubhouse was the hottest thing. Black folks were talking about Clubhouse. They were talking about, oh my God, how amazing it is. And so here's a company that we were using and people were like, oh, I have my own room on Clubhouse and uh, I have X number of people. And they were going on and on. And I had people on my staff, oh, Roland, uh, man, you know, I think for you to show, I think, I think we need to have like a weekly chat on Clubhouse. And I was like, why? I said, have you checked to see how many people are actually in a room? They're like, yeah, but 
But everybody's talking about it. I was like, yeah, that way even advertisers, oh, you do something on Clubhouse. I remember uh, I was paid uh, several thousand dollars by one company to host a chat on Clubhouse, and it was literally 300 people in the room. I can go live right now on Instagram or Facebook and get more than 300 people. But it was this whole deal, and people talk about, oh, my God, but, but we're doing this for the culture. And I'm sitting there going, no, 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 no. What you're actually doing is you are taking our intellectual capital, you're taking our conversations, and you're having them in a space that we don't own, and you're actually making somebody else rich. So now apply that to music. Apply that to clothing, apply it to, to, to any number of things. I, I, I've heard people, I love when I hear people talk about, uh, it was we, uh, just actually it was about a few weeks ago, I was in New York, and uh, Spike Lee is doing a documentary on Colin Kaepernick. And, um, I, I, and, I, and I knew, I'm trying to remember, did I, have, did I have on, either I was wearing some Adidas or I was wearing some shoes from a black-owned shoe company out of Atlanta. I think I had the Adidas on. And so Spike saw my Adidas. He's like, what? No Jordans? I was like, Jordan ain't paying me no check. Why? I said, man, I said, I ain't never owned a pair of Air Jordans. Spike was like, what? Are you serious? I was like, yeah, I'm dead serious. I said, ain't no way in hell I'll be paying $200 for some damn athletic shoes. I said, ain't going to happen. I said, now, it might make more sense buy some damn Nike stock. Because I'm... I, I'm like, I'm buying some Jordans. I'm making Jordan and Nike rich. I'm just spending the money. I'm a consumer. Yet I see folks, I mean, they will stand in line for days to get the hottest pair of Jordans or the latest shoe from LeBron. That's absolutely idiotic to me. And I hear people talk about, oh, no, no, but no, man, no, but this is what it is. Man, it's the style. You know, we're doing it for the culture. No, no, you're doing it for the Nike culture. Nike getting paid. Not Nike getting paid a whole lot of money. But the question is, how many of us are? See, we really have to begin to look at this completely different because um, we have lots of great conversations. Black people, I mean, we can have some great conversations. We love, how many of y'all uh, growing up, y'all saw, remember when Tavis Smile used to have those state of the black, black, black America conversations? And man, they be, I mean, folk be like several thousand people in the room. And my whole deal always was, yes, great conversation, but then what's going to happen on Monday? See, we're excellent at having these discussions, but how do you now translate a discussion into action that literally changes and redefines the culture? I've probably visited now 65 or so of America's HBCUs. And without fail, I will listen to alumni and students and faculty go on and on and on about the value of our HBCUs and what they mean. I mean, they're they going on and on and on. Oh, you got to come back for homecoming week. You got to come back for the probate shows. They go on and on and on. Yet ask this question, what's the giving rate of its alumni? See, I, I had folks, I, I'm a graduate of Texas A&M, and uh, we were, it was very interesting, we were on, we were on the Tom Drew on the Morning Show cruise, and, of course, Tom is probably the biggest HBCU advocate when he had his show on for 25 years. His foundation, Tom Jonah Foundation, raises money for HBCUs. He's told his kids, y'all can go to any school. I'll pay for any school, but it has to be HBCU. I mean, major HBCU advocate. So we sit there, and Tom goes, oh, he says, Roland, I, I bet you really, really regret not going to HBCU. I was like, no, not really. I said, I'm good. I had a hell of four years at Texas A&M. See, I, I wasn't about to have somebody somehow make me feel bad I didn't go to HBCU. I said, TSU was across the street from my high school. Prairie was 50 miles away. Neither one recruited me, and I was the best journalism student uh, in the state. I said, so Roland followed the money. Mama, Mom and Daddy had three kids in college at one time, my brother, me, and my sister. 
I said, so I was going where the money was. Whoever wanted to cut a check, that's where we were headed. <laughs> that wasn't a hard conversation. Mom and daddy never made more than $50,000 in a year. They cut, they, look, they didn't send us money when we were in college, so I followed the money. I said, well, I'm not about to be, feel bad. Now, what I tell folks is, what, 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 so what I tell folks at HBCUs, don't denigrate somebody who went to a PWI because you don't know their situation, but also don't, other folks who went to PWIs don't say, oh, you went to a lesser than school because you went to HBCU. But see, the thing that's interesting, I have people tell me, yeah, but you missed the whole, you missed the, but it's the culture, it's the culture. I was like, no, nah, college is about getting a sheet of paper. I said, let me just keep this, it is, it's about getting a sheet of paper. All that other stuff, all, all that, mm -mm. It's, about get, it's about getting a sheet of paper to get the hell out, to get a job, to get paid. Ain't, look, ain't nobody asked me for a transcript since I left. Nobody. Now, other folk, they, look, depending upon what your major is, if you're trying to go to medical school, law school, other stuff, engineering, school, graduate programs, a whole different deal. My, my business is a skill set based business. Can you do the job? Yes or no? If you are 4.0, you've got no experience, and you are 2.0, and you got experience, the 4.0 4 ain't got a shot at all. Because it's a matter of the skill set. But, but it's always interesting when people are talking about, yeah, but it's, it's the HBCU culture. And I'm going, okay, but, but if the culture is that meaningful, if it matters that much, then why at the average HBCU, the alumni giving rate is 5%? That means 95% of all its graduates, and I'm not talking about this is 95%, 5%, People, they're sending a thousand. No, no, no. This is a dollar. That means 95% of the graduates aren't sending a dollar back to the school. So how can we have a conversation? Y'all take care. How can we have a conversation? We're live streaming this so y'all can actually see this uh, on our Black Star Network app. So y'all can see the whole speech. How can we talk about the culture and we must preserve the culture of HBCUs if we're unwilling to literally fund it when we're gone. The day I walked onto the campus of Texas A&M, we were indoctrinated into the Aggie way. It was the culture of the university. And that was what you give back, what you do, how you support the university. I mean, the day, the day walking to the campus. And so when I hear us talk about preserving the culture, doing it for the culture, then you got to ask, well, how are we actually doing it? We have these conversations talking about, oh, my goodness, how we've got to close the racial wealth gap. All right. But how intentional are we with our decisions? So let me ask this question. This is not meant to embarrass y'all, but just a perfect example. How many of you, how many of you have identified black owned restaurants here in Nashville. And you consciously say, I'm gonna go eat at that restaurant. Okay. How many of you have, have you identified any black owned dry cleaners here in Nashville? Hmm? See, see and I want you to start thinking about things that you do on a daily or weekly basis. And then how does that translate into where do you go? So if you need something hemmed or tailored, do you proactively say, I'm going to find a black owned tailor or seamstress? It then, so then now this thing goes to different levels. So now all of a sudden, okay, so if I'm getting picked up. My question is, am I, are y'all calling a black transportation company? Not somebody black who works at the transportation company. Are you calling a black transportation company? See, the conversation of we must do it for the culture, preserve the culture, really then requires us to then ask, who the hell is sitting around the table? I, I love the story when Beyonce went to meet with Reebok and she walks into the meeting and literally all of the executives were non-black. And she was like, 
uh, y'all can excuse me, and left. See, it's a problem when I listen to people, entertainers and others, talk about doing stuff for the culture, and then you start asking the questions, okay, but are you using black lawyers, black accountants, black PR firms? Are you using black video firms? When you have events, are you using black caterers? When you're building something, are you using black architects? See, so it's real easy to say, oh, we're doing this for the culture, but it's hard, but it's different when you start asking about how are you practicing this for the culture? We just, uh, in January, we unveiled our new offices uh, for Roland Martin Unfiltered and my Black Star Network, the OTT Network. And we moved into a new space. And in that particular space, we had to obviously um, put stuff in, have a control room built, have lights built, have lights installed, we'd have a green screen installed, with all this different stuff that was done. And all of that was done by black companies. Now, why? Because what often happens is folks always say, man, it's hard to find somebody. No, you just can't. You just not. One, you don't want to look or you're not looking in the right place or you really don't care. So that's when excuses all come in. And then, of course, I always hear this. Well, you know, we I, I hired somebody black once. But you've hired five white folks to do this stuff and stuff. I'm like, come on, now, let's, let's not play this game. One of the things that we have to understand. And this really requires a, a completely change of mind. There has to be a massive reprogramming of black America. And when I say reprogramming of black America, I mean a literal reprogramming where the moment we say something and we find out that the person or the company is black, we do not immediately consciously or subconsciously go, I don't know. You know they black. How many times have you actually heard that? I don't, I don't know. You know how we are. You know how we can be. Those phrases alone immediately establish in our minds, in the minds of the person we're talking to, that what is black is less than. That it is second class. That is not valuable. And so when that happens, we, we do it so easily that we don't even realize how it's impacting the other people who we're talking to, where it gets to the point where they're sitting here going, well, maybe, maybe so. And so then we're now casting doubt. We planted the seed of, well, it's not going to work out in the minds. So now we're looking at them differently than we are somebody else. We were, I'm, I was, I'm a three-time board member of the National Association of Black Journalists. Um, life member. Uh, was just named to our Hall of Fame in December. And we were having a conversation about this black targeted network that went out of business called Black News Channel. And one of our folks said, uh, I want to go harder. There was a class action uh, lawsuit filed um, alleging sex, sexual harassment, discrimination, pay discrimination, all kinds of different stuff. And so one of our folks said, I want to hit them harder than we hit other companies. I was like, nope, we ain't doing that. They were like, what do you mean? I said, I'm not going to hit a black targeted company harder than I would hit a white company. Well, we should because they should know better. I said, no, I'm going to hit them equally. See, when you hear that phrase, oh, I, oh, you black, oh, I'm, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard because you should know better. No, the standard is the standard. So when that happens, again, what we're subconsciously doing is we're setting up a different standard, a higher standard. We're making our folks have to jump a higher hurdle than someone else, meaning that we are more accepting of it from one group than somebody else. 
You, you, take, you take a lot of these reality shows. How, how many of y'all look at any of these housewives shows, the, the, the dating shows on OWN, or any of these? Not like, cause first of all, some of y'all lying right now. Y'all like, I don't even want to raise my hand because I'm scared what he going to say. Just go ahead. Don't, just, seriously, if, if you watch any of these, Love and Hip Hop, the, all, any of these shows, raise your hand. Now, you see, y'all, some of y'all like, some of y'all, I'm trying to raise my hand. All right. Now, I'm going to show y'all how this works. If a black-owned network had put on any of these shows, black people would be protesting the company every single day. But we have no problem watching Bravo when they do it. We have no problem watching VH1 when they do it. We have no problem watching any of these networks when they do it. So we literally will say to a black man, absolutely not. How dare y'all put that stuff on? Y'all disrespecting, showing us, acting a buffoon, but our eyeballs will go and watch it on a white-owned network quickly, and guess what happens? They have higher ratings, which means they get more of the advertising dollars, so the same black people will literally slay a black network. And so the problem is the black network is trying to compete for eyeballs. Well, hell, I can't compete if you're watching trash over here, but then tell me I can't put on trash because I'm black owned, but you fine with trash if it's white owned. That literally makes no sense whatsoever. But that literally is what we do every single day we will we will watch a white on network y'all should have this 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 why aren't we seeing this but then we have a black on network this upstart network that has some of that yeah but y'all don't look as good as them well first of all they do a billion dollars a year in profit and we do five million uh i'm sorry billion five million billion five million there literally is no comparison. But we then don't ask the question, well, hold up. How did they get to be a billion dollar company? Which then means, what, is it, what do we have to do to ensure that a black owned company becomes a billion dollar company? See, this, this notion of the culture hurts us because we are not being completely conscious in all decision making, and not only not being completely conscious in all decision making, what we're also not doing is we're not being fully honest with ourselves about how we can be change agents in terms of redefining that. I, I had some. I had someone told me several years ago, Roland. I don't know why you keep blasting people who use the N word on your uh, Twitter. You can't change anybody's mind. I said, well, that's a lie. I said, because literally there have been people who have said, damn, man, I stopped using the N-word because you were so hard against it. I said, so, it's like, yeah, okay, fine. That's 10, 15 people. I said, no, 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 no. You first said I couldn't change anybody's mind. Then when I told you, you told me, well, that's not a lot of people. I said, well, first of all, you can't show me any movement that changed a lot of people that didn't start changing one person. Every movement begins with just one person. If, if 50 people who follow me stop using the N-word, they more than likely are selling, saying in their household, don't use that around me or my children. I don't have a conversation about the E-R or the A. It's the same damn thing to me. And I love it when I have these hyper-conscious black people come to me with that. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold up. How are you super black? but you're using the same language of the oppressor against somebody black, but you're super conscious. That's a contradiction. And then those will say, well, right, I don't see what the big deal is, man. It's just a word. I'm like, well, let your white professor call you that. And then what's going to be your response? See, a standard is a standard. 
So we say for the culture, for me, I'm not going to accept something that I believe is negative for the culture and this whole deal of how we're reclaiming it. No, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to have a completely different view of it. Last time I was here, we are going to the basketball game. They had a DJ who was in a parking lot. And the music he's playing, I hear bitches, hoes, motherfuckers, all kind of shit. And so I'm sitting turning around. And there are a number of folks with their kids. Now, I could be like a lot of other folk, a lot of black folk. Hey, that ain't my issue. I ain't hire that person. Let me just go on inside to the game. But if you actually are about the culture, then you are a person who says, no, I'm going to step to this person and say, say, bro, I might, you might want to change the record. And I did. And the young brother was like, what you mean? I can't change the record. I'm like, I guarantee you in your laptop, you got a whole bunch of other songs you can play. He's like, what do you mean? That's what folks want to hear. I said, do you see all these kids walking up? And he looked at me perplexed, like, who, I know he's probably, I don't know who this old head is, but my whole deal was, you may not think it's a big deal what you're playing, but those young kids are literally hearing what you're playing. Now, if you are an adult, you can play what you want to play. But someone, again, who is, who is, who is consciously thinking, you are aware of what they are hearing and then now what they are now taking in. See, that's looking at this thing from a whole different, what did I say about being reprogrammed? If I'm accepting of all kind of stuff around me and I'm like, yo, it's cool. Everybody else is fine with it. Well, then what does it say about our level of respect when it comes to our children and then what we want them to do in the future. And so what I'm talking about here is we have to begin to completely rethink this whole notion of what we're doing for the culture and how we are contributors to really our own demise. And so whether we're talking about HBCUs, whether we're talking about uh, look, for the last number of years, I've, been, I've said to every single uh, D- Divine Nine organization, we cannot be so insular where we are so locked up into what our fraternity or sorority is doing and we're not fully leveraging our resources and our power for the good of the black community. After Sandra, uh, after Sandra Bland was, uh, was found uh, uh, dead in her jail cell, there were protests and there was part of the Black Lives protests. And I remember uh, the Delta sent a uh, letter out saying their members could not wear their letters to any protest. Oh, they caught hell. And I remember texting the general president of, of the Alphas, Brother Tillman, and he said, oh, absolutely not. We sent one out encouraging brothers to wear letters. So that was this fear of, well, what would happen if a member does something and they wear letters and they get sued? So we were so on this side of being so cautious, risk averse, that we were lit, that they were literally speaking against what has always, what has been one of the missions of the sorority. And then that led to a whole blowback among Deltas like, oh, hell no. And then the other D9 groups like, hey, we we should be encouraging our members. See, again, that's now looking at this whole notion of, well, the culture totally different. How can we sit here and talk about, oh, the value of our organizations and what we do and our numbers and all this sort of stuff if we're not actually changing black communities all across the country? So I've, I've said to all of them, I said, you got nine D- D- nine folks. I said, look, your school board meets probably once a month. They might take off in the summer for once a month, even for the holidays. So you only got about, really about 10 meetings a year. I said, there should be a one D9 organization attending a school board meeting at least once a month where 20, 30, 50, 100 members are showing up in their colors speaking to the issues about our education. 
I said, what you think is going to happen if one month is the Deltas, one month is the Alphas, one month is the Omegas, one month is the Kappas showing up? Now let's go outside of that. Then all of a sudden, Eastern Star, Prince Hall Masons. You start links. You start not talking about all these black organizations. Now all of a sudden, you're talking about how we're using our collective power to now redefine our communities. Now you begin to talk about how do we leverage our numbers. And so if Deltas have three or four or 500,000 members nationally, and then you talk about AKs and Alphas and Omegas, total D9 is around 2 million. Think about this here. That means that if the D9 organizations alone said, we're buying this book by this black author this month, let's just say 10% of the membership 200,000 copies will be moved every month. That change. Let's all of a sudden say it's a black publishing company. We're going to buy two of their books a month. 10%. That's a tithe. That's 400,000 copies every single month. That completely changes the economics of that black publishing company. Now, do the same thing when it comes to music. Do the same thing when it comes to clothing. Do the same thing when it comes to another area. Now, all of a sudden, you are now really thinking totally differently now about what's for the culture. See, what, see what, I'm, what I'm outlining literally is what black people used to do when we had no choice. If you actually study our history, if you even study your university's history, the history of this painting, you had white folks in the South who made it their mission, we are going to shut every black college down. And they targeted Fisk. And these folks behind us travel the world singing, raising money. Money raised thwarted those white races from shutting the university down. Handful of voices singing. That was for the culture. Now think about this here. See now, I'm, I'm, think about it. So the actions of the folks in this painting Save a university then, and you are now sitting in the same place now. So was that for the culture? Do you now see how doing something for the culture can have an impact 130 years later? So when I say that you are caretakers of the culture, what I'm saying is literally the actions that you take today could very well have an impact on young brothers and sisters who you will never ever know or meet who aren't even born yet. That's why this notion of being caretakers of the culture is so important because if we are so wrapped up in ourselves for the moment and it's only about the moment, then we lose sight of our institutions. That's why for me, having a black owned media company is important because I don't have to ask somebody for permission. I don't have to go. And you can, again, this is nothing against black folks who work at mainstream media. There's nothing against a Robin Roberts or a Don Lemon or a Jerrica Duncan or, or Joanne Reed or, or, or Deborah Roberts, any of those folks. But here's the reality. 
Robin Roberts just celebrated 20 years at Good Morning America. Robin Roberts probably, make, I think she's making anywhere from 18 to 20 million dollars a year. I mean, great position, huge visibility. I mean, lots of money. But here's the reality. She still has to ask executives at ABC for permission to go broadcast from somewhere. That means if they go, eh, Robin's a great idea, we just don't think it's uh, worthy of broadcasting for a week. They say no. Hugely popular. Beloved. Making lots of money. Still has to ask permission. And that is the difference between someone saying doing something for the culture or making money for culture vultures. When you see what's happening right now, when you see, again, I told you at the, at the outset, people love black people. We make everybody else money. But it comes also down to what is it that we own and control? Do we own and control land? Do we own and control natural resources? Do we own and control powerful institutions? The fact of the matter is, it's no. And if we do, it's so small because we have not been able to build capacity to make them large enough to be able to compete. So when you look at the history of Black-owned media. If you study Robert Abbott, the Chicago Defender, and A.I. Scott in the Atlanta Daily World, and Pittsburgh Courier, and Frederick Douglass in the North Star, what you will see is you will see these institutions that played a huge part of creating the opportunity for where we are right now. During World War II, because black newspapers were writing about racism in the armed forces, the federal government literally threatened to shut black newspapers down and to imprison the publishers for treason because they said, y'all are stirring up dissension in the masses. They said, wait a minute, hold up. We writing about racism of black soldiers in your armed services. Yeah, but y'all are getting them really riled up and upset. So they were more pissed off with black papers writing about racism than they were about the racism against the black soldiers. They literally threatened to shut them down and put them in prison. Well, they did was for the culture. Now, Gerald Horn has a book called Claude Barnett's Associated Negro Press, but the subhead is called The Jim Crow Paradox. And this is The Jim Crow Paradox. The Jim Crow Paradox is, was that black media crusading and fighting to end Jim Crow while they were putting a nail in Jim Crow, they were actually putting a nail in their future. Because as we integrated, we then said what we own was less significant, so therefore what they had was more important. So we literally abandoned black-owned restaurants to go to white-owned restaurants because we now could. Now realizing that we were literally ending these black-owned restaurants. Well, who do you think were funding our black institutions? So what is the situation that we're in right now? The situation we're in right now is that Black America is dependent upon white philanthropy to continue. You don't believe me? Look up the ex-wife of Jeff Bezos. Who knows who that is? No one knows her number? I mean, knows her name? Seriously? The former wife of Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon. Say it again. Mackenzie Scott. Scott. Why is that name important? Say it again. Define a lot. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Keep going. No. No. She donated the range from 10 to $50 million to a number of HBCUs. Her donations alone completely changed the endowments of HBCUs. 
the average HBCU endowment was around $20 million. Harvard is $40 billion. Your largest endowments of HBCUs, Spelman, Morehouse, Hampton, her donations completely changed the dynamics of HBCU endowments. One woman. But the point I'm making is, take the amount that she gave, but you have to juxtapose it to the fact that five to seven percent of black HBC graduates are giving back to their own school. So we are depending, our future literally right now is dependent upon white philanthropy. One of the things that I keep saying is, and we are, we're excellent at this, we, we talk about, and I guarantee if I went around this room, y'all would all talk about, tell me your survival story, how you got here, what you went through growing up, what your mama went through, your daddy went through, your grandparents went through, what you've gone through being here. We are excellent at talking about how we have survived. At some point, we have to shift from survive conversation to a thrive conversation. And that's what I'm talking about, how we must completely re-examine this whole notion of the culture, what we're doing for the culture. I had people who were telling me, man, when TV One canceled uh, News One Now, man, I wish you'd get a show uh, on CNN or get a show on MSNBC. I was like, um, you do know that if I got a show, they own all the content. They control the content. They get to decide whether we do the story or not. You, in the last few weeks, how many times have y'all heard people talk about, oh my goodness, all this focus on Ukraine, that you've had a lots of humanitarian crises happening in African nations, and we don't hear about it. And the very people on mainstream media saying how we don't hear about it, are the same ones not talking about it. Now think about that. You can't complain about how we don't talk about humanitarian crises that's happening in Africa if you have a show and then you don't talk, you are part of the same damn problem. I don't have that problem because I own the show. I can talk about it any number of times I want to. See, that is the difference. So we're talking about how do you do something for the culture. What I understand is that a video or a show that we do today will live on in perpetuity. Meaning somebody 50 years from now may come across that very interview or that very commentary and may go, man, I didn't know this. And that may very well change their view of a particular issue and it was done 50 years before. That is when you begin to talk about how do you become a caretaker of the culture? That means that you are thinking beyond yourself, you're thinking beyond the movement, and you're trying to say, let's do something that is transformative, that actually has an impact beyond what I'm doing today. And that's really where I want each one of you to be thinking about that when you leave here, and I'm, I'm not talking about, oh, man, I can do all that after I've worked for 20 years and I've made a lot of money and say, no, the reality is you can be a caretaker of the culture today, but it requires you to use this differently than you're using it now. It requires you to now to have different types of conversations with your circles than you're having now. And there may be some people in your circle like, man, I wish you shut the hell up. Why you keep bringing all this stuff up? But the reality is, if you are not enlightening and educating someone, then who will? Who better to change a peer than a peer? I know all the phrases. Man, we ain't trying to hear what them older folks got to say. Man, that stuff. They don't realize what we're going through. That stuff. Every generation says the exact same thing. And the problem that we are now facing is we're now facing a worse crisis than we have ever faced in that we have been so successful at giving everybody else our culture that we literally are on the verge of owning nothing that is ours. 
nothing. That should scare the hell out of every single person sitting in this room. For me in media, I said, there's no way in the world I am going to be in a situation where I'm going to ask somebody else to please cover our story. That, ain't, that shit ain't happening. It's not going to happen. It's not. Because what do I look like? Man, I sure wish, I sure wish uh, MSNBC and CNN, I, I wish they were covering uh, that housing crisis um, at, uh, at this HBCU. Why, why, why we got to wait for them to show up to cover a story that we can actually cover? Now, take that beyond. We now are waiting. And I, I, look, I'm going to tell y'all it happens all the time. I, I, I know, there are black members of Congress who turn us down my show all the time. But if MSNBC call them and say, can you do a live hit at 5 a.m., they'll wake their ass up and do it. I'm going to be straight up. Because what we have to understand is, remember I said about reprogramming? We have got to change our mindset about white validation. White validation is kryptonite to black people. White validation is no joke. And remember I told y'all earlier how we say stuff and we don't even realize what we're saying and how we're saying it? How many of y'all saw the Kings of Comedy concert? This was Bernie Mac, Dio Hughley. So, so you remember the line where Bernie Mac said, and he was joking, but he wasn't joking. When he said, when he said what's up to all the black people? Then he said, what's up to all the white people? He said, now you don't you know you done made it when a white folks show up at your show. Oh, that is a strong belief for a whole lot of people. What is one of the greatest desires of black artists to cross over? What is what does crossover mean? What does crossover mean? No, 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 no. It ain't genres. That's crossover. Crossover is white folks coming to my concert. What dumbass Lil Wayne say? Oh, no, nah, ain't no racism in America. Man, I, I, I got white fans. I guess he didn't realize that white races hired black entertainers to perform for them and still wouldn't let them use a restroom. This ain't, white folks showing up at your concert does not mean that racism does not exist. It means they like your music. <laughs> Harry Belafonte performed at the Palmer House Hilton. You gotta read his book, his, read his memoir. He performed at the Palmer House Hilton in Chicago, sold out, and Harry said, I ain't going through the damn kitchen. So Harris said, I'm going to walk through the front door of the Palmer House Hilton. And they stopped him. Uh, you can't walk through the front door. He said, I'm sorry. Uh, the 3,000 tickets that were sold, they sold to hear me. They said, we don't care. Harris like, all right. Harris set his ass down on the steps. He said, ain't going to be no show till I walk through the door. They had to call the corporate office in New York to get permission to let him walk through the front door. He said, there ain't going to be no concert. So this idea that you got white fans, that, that, that don't mean Jack. Will Smith had, had a lot of white fans until he slapped Chris Rock. It's amazing how fast they jumped off that ship. What we have to understand is that the preservation of our culture can only be preserved by the people who live and breathe the culture. 
We cannot in any way whatsoever think that our culture is going to be preserved and owned and controlled by us as long as we are willing to sell it to the highest bidder. We have to understand that if you do not own your culture, then literally you own nothing. And owning your culture means owning what your culture creates. And so we have to, so I, I said it was on the show last week, uh, uh, every Tuesday on my show, we feature a black owned business. Every Tuesday in our marketplace segment. Every Wednesday in our Tech Talk segment, we feature a black owned tech company. Now, I don't charge these businesses who are coming on. You're talking about a segment, six, eight, 10 minutes. I've got 3.6 million social media followers. Uh, we get 300,000 some odd views a day. Uh, and so obviously that helps them tremendously. We've had companies that have come on Seek with a virtual reality company selling their headphones and VR devices. Sold about $100,000 worth of uh, headphones and devices uh, in about three weeks. Um, the company Rock Deep, athletic shoe company, they were on, uh, on uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, and uh, they sold um, twenty or $30,000 uh, worth of shoes. And so I've had comp owners say, man, man, we've got a huge response coming on your show. The reason that happens is because I own it. I decide that's the segment. I decide that's who's getting featured. I decide this is how much time they're going to get. I decide all that because I own it. And so here we are three and a half years in launching this show, and we have, we have featured numerous black-owned businesses, black-owned businesses that have done crowdfunding campaigns because the whole point is n other media outlets, again, by validation, you have to hit a certain level before all of a sudden you get on their radar. And see, I will jack folk up who treat us second class. Oh, you want to call me now after you call them? Or when you call white media to cover your story and nobody showed up, now you want to call Roe? Now it ain't happening. And, and just so y'all understand, this is not, oh, you can do it now because you own. No, I've been that way my whole life. I ran the Houston Defender. This is 1999. I get a phone call. The mayor of Houston, Lee Brown, first black mayor of Houston, went on a trip to South Africa, took four or five Houston police officers with him for security detail. Local newspaper, TV station, doing stories. He cost the taxpayer $75,000 with a security detail going to South Africa. So all of a sudden, my phone rings. And I don't know if it was the chief of staff or the mayor or the press secretary for communications, but I get a phone call. Hey, Roland, uh, you know, you might, we would love to bring the mayor by the office. I was running the Houston Defender, the top black newspaper. To bring the mayor by the office and have a meet with you and the editorial board. And you know, we see all these stories we've been getting criticized. And he just kept talking and talking. And I was like, you done? He said, yeah. I said, fuck Lee Brown. Oh, I did. Y'all, I ain't got, I, don't, I ain't fronting. I said, y'all took your asses to South Africa. Y'all didn't call me before you left to go to South Africa. But now you come back and white media is kicking your ass. They writing stories, they dogging you. Now you want to call black media to save your ass. No, that's not going to happen. I said, in fact, I'm going to kick y'all ass in the paper this week. And there was a local TV station they had a Sunday show called uh, Newsmakers, and we had a seat on it. And I, I said, and then when I go on the show Sunday, I'm going to kick y'all ass on the show. Then I'm going to kick y'all ass next week. But y'all going to learn not to call me after the fact to save your ass when white media has been giving you hell. Hung up on his ass. Now, some of y'all looking like, oh, damn, he snapped. No. I needed them to understand you are not going to treat me like a second class citizen and call me after the fact. You better learn to call me before you go on the trip the same way you call them.
part of this idea of being caretakers of the culture is you've got to be willing to look some black folks in the eye and call them to task when they want you to save their butt late in the game and not before. You've got to be willing to check some folk who want to treat you as if you were an afterthought because they're chasing white validation when you better say, no, 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 we were here before they were here. That's why there are certain people, Jasmine Koenig is a sister, uh, she's a lesbian out of L.A. She was a white guy, Ed Buck, who led to kill two black people, uh, pumping the body with drugs. And Jasmine couldn't get white gay folk, couldn't get other people to cover the story. And Jasmine called me. I put it on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, put it on my TV One show. And, when, and last Friday, Ed Buck got sentenced to 30 years in prison. And Jasmine said, Roland, everybody has been calling me trying to get me on Come On A TV Network. She said, and I've turned everybody down because you are the, you will get the first interview with me. She said, because when nobody would put me on the air, you did. She said, there were gay journalists who wouldn't put me on the air, but you did. And she said, you will get the first interview. That is how you preserve black culture is when you have an appreciation for blackness, for the people who stand with you or with you, and you do not abandon your own people because you're chasing white validation. Because trust me, when they are done with you, ask Tiger Woods, ask Will Smith, ask OJ. Hell, when Oprah endorsed Obama, ask her how those white women reacted to her when she did. So I tell everybody, always maintain your black base, respect your black consumers who are also your customers, and you can be caretakers of this culture because, look, every single one of, every single one of us has an expiration date, and you have to be willing to take care of what you can while you have it, and you can't assume this person next to you who could be your family member or your friend is going to do it. Only you can. That's what we all have to do. Questions? I'm done. <laughs> Got time for questions? And we start the food at 4 o'clock, right? Cool. Cool, fine. All right, go ahead. Well, first of all, white folks have had a tremendous head start, so the reality is you're not going to see a switch in terms of the control of wealth. But what has to happen is there has to be, we have to, we have to rethink in terms of how we're now looking at this whole deal. Um, and what I mean by the sun's coming out, so it's getting the warm. So here's what I mean by that. So you've got people who fight for reparations. I got no problem against that. How long is it going to take? No, no, I, I, want you, I, but I want you to think Critically and tactically. So I have people say, Roland, uh, you should be focusing on this every single day. I'm like, nope. Because what I'm focusing on right now is the money that I actually see. The federal government spends $560 billion a year on contracts. Black people get 1.67% of an existing $560 billion. The federal government spends a billion dollars on advertising every year. Black media gets 51 million of the 1 billion. In the entire general market, advertising industry, black, $322 billion is spent every year on advertising. Black owned media gets 0.5 to 1% of that. Now, I know many people who are strong advocacy, advocacy reparations. I can make the argument for reparations. But what that, what that requires, though, is for me to convince a lot of white folks to vote yes in the House and the Senate, then get the president to sign, then that then has to withstand, then they got to fund it, then it has to withstand a legal challenge. So the black farmers, they just put $5 billion in the budget for black minority farmers, and the white farmers immediately sued. Money's been held up for more than a year because they sued. 
They're still waiting. Some of those farmers are going out of business while they're waiting. So the point I'm making is you have, we have to make tactical decisions, and that is what is short, mid, and long term? What are, what are we going after? What are the resources that we're going after? I'm looking at right now, okay, where, okay, there are three or four people in here from Memphis, okay? If you're from Memphis, you should be sitting here going, okay, Memphis, it's a lot of black people in Memphis. So if you're from Memphis, who from, uh, what, three over here? How many from Memphis? One. I know it's at least you. Okay, a couple months left. I know there were at least four from Memphis. You should right now be going, how much does the Memphis school district spend? What's the city budget? What's the county budget? That's three pools of money right now. Then, how much does private industry in Memphis spend with black companies? See, part of this other thing is, is that we get caught up and also we're trying, like, uh, so where are you from again? Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson, Mississippi. So you got somebody in, you from Jackson, Mississippi, and there's somebody in Jackson who spent a whole lot of time worrying about what's happening in Orlando versus, I might want to focus on Jackson. How do you take your time and what do you give it to? And so that's how I look at the resource conversation. That is, what am I going after right now and what can we get and what can we leverage? Because again, if you go to my YouTube channel, I did this video the other day. There's leverage, influence, and power. Michael Jordan, when he played, Michael had leverage and influence. People say, oh my God, Michael's the most powerful basketball player. No, he's not. If you don't own, you don't have power. Or you can influence. You can bring your leverage. You can bring the weight of your popularity to your power. So when you talk about the money, when I'm hitting President Biden on advertising money, I'm like, you need black votes. We need to change the dynamics of getting 1%. I'm leveraging our voting power to hit capital. That's what Mayor Jackson did. Mayor Jackson, when Mayor Jackson took over as the mayor of Atlanta, and this is where history is, comes in. One of y'all, she was a history major. Um, I think there's another history major over here. We have to also factor in history. We can't just think what happened last week or in our, li our lifetime actually got us where we were today. Mayor Jackson becomes mayor of Atlanta in 1973. Black people got 0.0012% of all contracts. Not 1%. Not 0.5 percent, not 0.25 percent. They were getting 0.0012 percent of all city contracts. Maine was like, "Oh hell no, that ain't gonna happen," because Maine's grandfather taught him three Bs: the ballot, the book, and the buck. The ballot politics, the buck is economics. He merged those two. So he said, I'm going to change the economic future by hitting the money. He said, tumbleweeds will be rolling down the runway of Atlanta airport. It will not get rebuilt if black companies don't have any uh, sizable contracts. The reason Atlanta is the black mecca economically today is because of how Mayor Jackson used the power of the mayor office. And then Andrew Young. And then Mayor Jackson came back. And then you had, of course, Bill Campbell, Shirley Franklin, Kasim Reed, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Now you have Andre Dickens. But it's understanding the dynamics. Part of the problem, that what we do is, we, we, some of us are so all over the place, where you know, how can I be targeted in terms of what I'm hitting? For me, I'm hitting existing money. And if all of a sudden, in, if I, in, in my lifetime, I can kick enough ass, to go from 1% to 5 or 5 to 10? Think about it. If we're getting 1% of federal contracts is a billion dollars, 51 million. If all of a sudden we go to 5, that's 250 million. What would take us, what would take us five years to make, we can do it in one. Now we hit 10%. 
Damn, we go from 51 million. See, all, see you see all of a sudden how the game changes? We have to th be thinking that way in terms of when we talk about wealth. But that's what we're fighting for. But the other piece of building wealth is we got to spend with black people. When I built my studio, my lighting grid was $60,000. That went to a black lighting company. The set, my news desk was $8,000. That went to a black set design company. To outfit my control room was about $45,000. That went to a black engineering company. So I sp I've spent almost $200,000 in my studio space and more than half of the money has gone specifically to black owned companies. That's being intentional. So part of this issue about creating wealth is we gotta be willing to actually spend money with each other. You have a follow up question, let me go here, go. Yes. 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 No, 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 no. He's no, no, no. He's you got to add something to it. He's one person who knows many people. See, part of this thing when you talk about the when you talk about leverage and influence is that if when I walk into the room, I just don't walk into the room. This walks into the room too. This is who I know. I was speaking to a group of black professionals. This sister is working for a major, a major Fortune 500 company. And basically, she was very high up and they decided, this is the highest you're gonna go, we're moving you out. She was despondent. She, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about she was in a state of depression. This is a Ivy League educated, brilliant sister who just could not believe what was happening to her. And I was like, this ain't the only goddamn company in, in the world. What, what, why are you freaking out? And so we were sitting there and we were having lunch. I said, well, do you know this person? She's like, no. I said, do you know this person? No. I said, do you know this person? This person? No. I said, well, I do. I said, so I'm going to make sure you connect with these people. So we're sitting here, we're sitting in London, we're talking, we're talking. Then I go, um, John said to uh, uh, give him a call. She goes, John. I was like, yeah, the, the John who I told you about. She says, y you already email him? I'm like, yeah. What the hell am I waiting on? I said, did I tell you I was going to email him? She said, yeah. I said, so what the hell am I waiting on? We're sitting right here. Three other people who I emailed and text hit back. She later becomes CMO of a major company making duck, smaller company, not as well-known brand, making double what she made there. Reporting directly to the CEO. I'm on the board of NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists, 2018, March 2018. We're sitting there. They tell me, oh, we don't have a, I'm like, okay, convention in three months. We don't have a major speaker lined up. And so they said, no. So they, so they start talking, well, we're going to do a letter and give it to so-and-so who's going to give it to so-and-so to get it to Oprah. I'm sitting there like, that ain't what I do. So I hit. Eric Logan, who's Eric Logan? He was the president of OWN. His office was across the hall from Oprah. Eric, I'm gonna send you a letter. I need you to walk it across the hall to Oprah. I wasn't about to go through two or three other people. 
We again, we sitting there, no speaker. I send text message, boom, boom, boom. Tyler Perry, Tyler, got an idea. This is the whole deal. Ninety minutes. Do whatever the hell you want. You can talk the whole time. You can have a Q and A. He so we, he said, wait a minute. He said I can take him to church. He's like, what did Tyler say? He said I can take him to church and school. I said, say man, I don't care what you do. You can do whatever you want with the ninety minutes. I said it's gonna be a master class. He said I'm back from Europe. He said on Tuesday. I said which day you want to speak? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I don't care. Morning, afternoon, night. I don't care. Up to you. He said, let's lock it in Thursday afternoon. Done. I was like, yo, Tyler's a speaker. They were like, who we got to call? I said, you got to call nobody. Tyler already agreed. So that's also part of the deal. One of the mistakes that we make is we don't, a lot of times, we don't know who they know. And so folks start talking. I know so-and-so and so-and-so, and I didn't realize who the hell they talking to, who they know. So that's the other piece as well. How do you, which goes back to the culture, which goes back to how do you collective? Because part of this whole idea I'm talking about is how do you leverage the collective? How do you move the collective? This ain't about, like if somebody hits me up, it's not about, okay, you need to cut me a check. I mean, people have called me and I was like, yeah, I'll connect you with so-and-so. Okay, great, y'all let me know how it goes. As opposed to, oh, you're gonna give me a finder's fee. No, I, that, I do that all the time. That's what Dion is doing. He's taking all the people who he knows and is bringing to, so when, so when, so the, so the deal is, again, this is, this is where, this is where your intellectual capital comes in. This also helps everybody should be listening to this when you come to negotiating. When they hire you, they're not just hiring you, they're hiring all of that. See, so for me, having my own company, again, this is how you get to see this thing totally different. When you talk about how do you preserve the culture. So I don't go through publicists to interview A-list entertainers. I go to the entertainer. So if I want to get Nas or T.I. or Will Smith or Chris Rock, or if I want to get any of the top comedians, Sith the Entertainer, Anthony Anderson, if I want to get, I can go down the line. I call them. They tell the publicist, Roland's person not calling you. So that's the other piece. So when you come in, you bring in all this with you, which now means when you're negotiating, you better negotiate because you bring in all of this with you. So no one pays you small because you go, you know I'm bringing all this with me. And all of this means people, relationships, resources. That's also part of the deal. And I will say this. And I say this from experience. And I go back to white supremacy. There are too many jealous as black people of your relationships. One of the, when, what, remember when I said the, the reprogramming of this, the re, this has to be, be, be reprogrammed among our own people because we have even some of our own people who are some of the greatest haters. And they can't stand who you know in the relationships. Man, that don't mean shit to me. I, I'm good. But there are people if they not at the front of the line with the first photo, they'll shut the whole thing down. I have seen individuals lose millions of dollars because of their ego. And so Dion's situation is not just Dion. He has an athletic director and a president who's perfectly fine with what he does because what he's doing is helping them. But trust me, it's a whole bunch of HBCUs will say, ain't no way in hell I will let Deion Sanders on my campus because their ego is getting in the way and their ego is also blocking blessings. And so for everybody in here, everybody who's watching, be very careful when you allow your ego to get in the way of blessings because here's the problem. You're actually blocking the blessings of students 
and faculty because your ego is in a way. And so that's the other thing. You got to remember what he's doing, that that's all he's helped by. He's got a folk who's not tripping on him getting all of the attention. Because a lot of we got a lot of people who they love getting all the attention and they flossing and they think they balling and they broke as hell. Go ahead. Or, or selling 20, 25%. But, it, but, 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 here, but here's something we, we got to own up to. There's, there's important this phrase, when you don't know, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Matt, I don't, I'm, I don't know if many of y'all have been watching that show Winning Time on HBO, the docuseries on the Lakers. Mm-hmm. Perfect example. Magic Johnson from Lansing, Michigan. All these shoe companies coming after him. Well, Phil Knight mm-hmm. said, I could offer you $1 and 100,000 shares per quarter or whatever. Magic turns, I don't know who this little white dude is with this shoe. The state, so Magic's worth right now, they say anywhere from four to 600 million. Mm -hmm. Had Magic turned down the 90 or 100,000 he got from Converse, and he later signed the 25 year, $25 million contract, which was the largest athletic endorsement contract ever at the time. Mm -hmm. Magic's stake in Nike today will be worth 5.2 billion. And Magic said, every time I drive past a Nike store, I kick my ass and I kick myself in the ass with the same pair of shoes. He said, but I was a black guy from the inner city of Lansing, Michigan, had no idea. So we also have to recognize that part of the issue that we do have as a culture is that who's in here is a first time college student. One, two, three, four. That's also part of the deal. We don't. It's a lot of stuff. We simply. We've never sat, sat at the table of power. So the key is when you've never sat at the table of power is to align yourself with people who have and listen to them. Your question. The first thing is there's a... Uh, uh, The only woman who was in the inner circle of Dr. King, her name is Dorothy Height. Excuse me, Dorothy Cotton. Dorothy Cotton. Um, Write the name down. You need to get her book. She was over the citizenship, citizenship education division of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. If you want to join the SCLC, you couldn't just join. You had to go through her program. They would assess you to determine whether you need to be reprogrammed because you had to fully buy into their concept of nonviolence before you could even go to attend any event. And so I didn't read that until after she died. I got her last sit down interview in 2018, February 2018. And I was blown away when I saw that because I had literally been saying this, this idea of reprogramming. And I was like, oh, shit, they were actually doing it. And so the reprogramming starts with it it is an intense personal thing where you have to decide yourself, who am I? What am I going to represent? For the long, what, first 25 years of my life, I freely use the N word. And I was like, one, why am I using this word? Why would I call? So why would I see a fellow brother and say, what up, my nigga? when I can easily say, what up my brother? Which one is more affirming? So that was a start. I've had grown brothers who in media, man, Ro, I, don't, I can't do that, man. I, I, just, I just can't stop. I said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You, yes, you can. This, this notion that I can't stop doing what I've always been doing it's a lie. 
It's just a flat out lie. But you have to make a conscious decision. So when I'll meet with some folks and inward just rolls up their mouth, it literally, it literally does not even enter my mind to say. And so now take that and now begin to apply the same thing to other areas of your life. And that is how you greet someone, how you look at someone. Do you walk into the room and speak to everybody? Or one of you supposed to, you ignore everybody. I remember I was at CNN and uh, one of our anchors, we were leaving and uh, it was like four or five security. I spoke to everybody and we, she, she kept talking. I said, uh, you ain't gonna say bye? Now, she was Latina. I'm black, all security guards are black. But see, it don't matter, they were all Latina. I would still say the same thing. Because see, for me, they are not invisible. I see them. Because for me, those are also my fans. So when I see the brother shining shoes, when I see the brother at the convenience store, today getting on the plane, I'm sitting there, you know, we got masks and everything, and I'm going up, and the woman, she, she checks me in, and she goes, uh, she said, go check the bag. I said, no, I'm in first class. And she looks, she's like, oh, Mr. Martin. And she goes, oh, my God. You have no idea how watching you has changed my mind on so many things. And she was just, she said, oh my, I wish I had more time. She was just shocked. I'm going to treat her the same I'm going to treat the CEO of United. So it's, it's, so you, it's, 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 it's start, it literally starts here. It's how you change yourself. So if you never change this, you can never talk to anybody else. And so it's identifying those things. Is sitting down and say, well, now what do I really do? I don't care what it is, for long as I couldn't stand apples. I wouldn't eat, I was like, I'm not eating, uh. It's kind of like, okay, now I still hate red apples, but I eat green apples. So I'm eating a damn apple. But again, that is still a state of mind. And that is in terms of what am I not going to do? And so it's practicing that. It's starting that, it's practicing that. It's, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one. He's a graduate of this university. Look his name up. Ronaldo Glover he used to be the chairman of the board of trustees. He's one of the greatest basketball players ever played in Fisk history. I think he still has some of your records. He was an amazing brother, Renaissance man, was attorney in Chicago. Uh, I met him when I ran Chicago Defender. Uh, just an in, in amazing cat. A bunch of y'all not writing his name down. I don't know why y'all not writing his name down. He literally is one of the greatest graduates of your university. His name is Ronaldo Glover, R-E-Y-N-A-L-D-O Glover, G-L-O-V-E-R. Ronaldo died of pancreatic cancer, I think in 2006, 2005 or 2006. But it's just a phenomenal brother. And this is what Ray would always do. Somebody would meet with him or he would meet with them. And he would say, how can I be of assistance? When he went, when, when he was going to be replaced as the chairman of the board of the city colleges of Chicago, he knew what the mayor was going to do. But Ronaldo still said, how can I be of assistance? Now, that could take on any meaning. Folk hit me, what you need? I can be curt to the point, quick, because it's like, boom. But, my, but it's sort of the same thing. How can I help you? What do you need? You're availing yourself to someone else to be of assistance. So now this thing is bigger than you. Go watch every single one of you. Write this down. Watch The Black Godfather, the documentary on Netflix of Clarence Avon. Same thing. He is called the Godfather because people would pick the phone up. If you study Andrew Young, Andrew Young does the same. People, people call him. One of the biggest things for too many of us, we are so focused on if it only benefits us, not realizing when we are helping others in our community, we are actually benefiting us. A benefit does not mean they're gonna call your name on stage. A benefit does not mean your name is gonna be placed on the wall. A benefit does not mean that they're gonna send you a check. But there is value in you being able to help someone else. And if they had any sense, and sometimes they don't, and it's gonna happen, 
Some folk will forget. Some folk will act like you don't exist. But you know you do. And there may come a time when you pay them back. I'm not, I'm not saying you should be that petty. But you can be petty. I'm going to close on this one because this actually happened. And I had no problem being petty because he pissed me off. So um, we're flying to New York, Atlanta, 2012, one of those election nights. We're flying for CNN, and so we're on a plane. We're leaving DCA. Something happens with our plane. We're going to land at IAD in Dulles, still in the DC area. So they're like, we got to drive the park and the mechanic from Dulles, from DC, from National over here. So now we're waiting. So Gloria Borger was one of our political senior analysts. Her producer's on the plane, so... He's like on the phone with, he's on the phone with, uh, with Atlanta. Now, mind you, it's four people on the plane from CNN. So he's talking to them about three of them. Not me. All right. So we got the plane. So now with this long ass line we're standing in. And so he's already had them rebooked on another flight. And then Glory goes, what about Roland? He goes, oh, I didn't ask about Roland but I'm sitting across from her. All right. So I go ahead and get on the plane. I, I, I made, made the same flight. So I'm sitting on the plane, all of a sudden she gets an email and oh my God, they want me on the air as soon as we land. And so now she's like, okay, we're landing late. We gotta go on the air. I think it was like 6.30 or something like that. So they're freaking all out. Now I'm chilling. I'm chilling, listening to all this go on. Read my book. And I was like, cause I didn't go until eight. I was like, oh, so you need to get on early? So, all right. Now, mind you, she's like, now we, they have a car for me. You can ride with us. I said, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need a car. I'm, and again, this is what happened when you don't know who you talking to. So I'm chilling, listening. And then now when she's talking about, she, so she's like, Gloria's panicking. I was like, like, I said, Gloria. We're going to get you there in time. Don't worry about it. You can ride with me. What? Let me ride with you. I said, well, when we get to that airport, there are going to be two police officers meeting me. I have an escort into the city. You can ride with me. She's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll be at CNN in 11 minutes. It's traffic. We'll be there in 11 minutes. You will make it lots of time. So then she goes, ah, let me go tell so-and-so. No. You can ride with me. He can get your bags. Take the car they have for you. So we pull, <laughs> land. Sure enough, walk off. Cop, rolling, how you doing? Got bags? Yep, they pulled my bags. Literally, as they're coming up, that's mine. That's my. Well, which one is yours? Pull the bags off. Put it in the SUV. I'm chilling. They got lights blurring, everything like that. I'm chilling. Read my book. Get there. She comes in. Oh my God! Y'all have got to ride with ropes. He's going on and on and on. They were like, "What happened?" I was like, um, "I got it like that." But that producer, he came like an hour and a half later. He had to wait. Got cut, caught in traffic. See, he didn't know who I knew. And I literally said, he going he gon I'm gonna pay his ass back for this. He didn't realize it came that fast. But that was one of those things. It wasn't hard for him to say, rebook four of us. He said, no, rebook three. All right. That's why he wasn't in that car with us. There was room. There was plenty of room. But he wasn't gonna get in the car with me. That's why. You never know who somebody else know, who somebody who got somebody else, and you. She had a car. She didn't have an escort. She would have been in traffic. That's why you always just be aware. You never look down on anybody else. You never treat anybody else small, because you never know who you're dealing with, and you never know who they know. That's how you. Protect the culture.
All right. That's it. All right, let's get some of that free food. Uh-huh. Yeah, we can do a photo. I'm going to take this. Off. Are we doing a group photo? All right. No problem. Hold on. Let me take this off. Anthony, come. Uh... Yeah, all y'all short people. I don't know why y'all stay in the back. No dog on well. Can't nobody see y'all.